as I begin the sermon when you're seated, but uh, for now, just welcome and let us open uh, with a word of prayer, if we can. Dear God, we thank you so much uh, for uh, this opportunity to worship. God, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for the beginning of spring weather. Uh, God, we thank you for the people that are here in this sanctuary and the people that are joining us online. And God, we just pray that you'd send down your Holy Spirit on this place. And God, that you would receive our worship and that you would open our hearts and our minds to your word. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, 
call the meeting. Fully human, 
and that's a really important part of Jesus. Dear Lord, Dear Lord thank you for sending your son. Thank you for sending your son. Jesus. Jesus. To our earth. To our earth. To show us how much you love us. To show us how much you love us. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us this week, and we'll catch you with that next week. Well, good morning again. Good morning. Um, since you're comfortable, I want to just go through a couple of announcements rather than um, we'll work on that. Um, rather than have you standing through the announcements. Um, we, uh, uh, first of all, we want to say that uh, we, have, uh, we have our blessing box still uh, with the uh, Presbyterian Church Cross Street to share that, and there's a, a need there. So if you have uh, some items, some food, uh, non perishable food items, or some uh, personal care items, uh, if you can drop those by the church, then we have a, a way to restock that. We appreciate you bringing those by. Um, we're also in need of greeters. We've had greeters at the, uh, the chapel doors by the parking lot. We're also in need of, of greeters on Sunday morning at the elevator door uh, to help folks who use that entrance uh, on Sunday morning. And so uh, if you would like to do that, well, first of all, if you happen to be at church and you see that nobody's there, uh, then you have uh, my permission to just go ahead and, and stand there, right? I think you can accomplish that. But if you'd like to be more formally uh, involved, uh, you can contact Carol at the office and uh, she can get you officially signed up to do that. Uh, and then we want to remind everyone of our ongoing uh, small group opportunities as we go through the Creed series. Uh, Wednesdays at 6 p.m. in person group here and a Zoom group at 6.30 on Wednesdays. And there's information uh, there in your bulletin and lots of other places about how to join that. Uh, and then a Thursday morning group in person at 9.15. Uh, so all those are available to you, so we hope that you will uh, take advantage of those and uh, continue following along in your devotional guide. Uh, and then uh, finally, just as I always uh, continue uh, your gracious and generous support of the church, there's a, a box for your donations as you leave. And of course, you can always uh, give online at wesleyonline.org slash give. Uh, and please stay tuned. We're going to be having announcements about Palm Sunday and Easter coming out very, very soon as we finalize plans on that. But mark your calendars. Mark your calendars for uh, particularly for Holy Thursday and Good Friday um, so that you can participate in those services. Uh, let us pray. Dear God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord our God and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, we continue our series today on the Apostles' Creed with the phrases, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. Um, these phrases deal with what is called the Incarnation and the passion or suffering of Jesus. First, we're going to look at the Incarnation. Uh, last week, we looked at the divinity of Jesus. We looked at the fact that he is uh, God, that he is the Son of God. This week, we're going to uh, concentrate on his uh, humanity. Jesus, the Greek tells us, was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, uh, that is, he is fully God and fully human. Now, let me make something very clear uh, to us. Uh, if, if we're ever going to get along together and participate in this Greek study together, uh, you have to, you have to, I'm going to say I have to, I have to, you have to believe in miracles. You have to have a supernatural, in addition to a natural worldview. Yes, yes, there is a natural world. There is a such thing as science. Uh, we, can, we can do things like practice medicine and predict weather uh, and, and have iPhones 
and have technology in church that works sometimes. Um, but, yes, there's a natural world, but there's also a supernatural world. We open the Bible, and, and the first thing we come to is a six-day creation. And we think, well, that's impossible. And you're right, it is impossible. That's why it's called a miracle. Then we get to stories about Moses, uh, ten plagues in Egypt, Moses parting the Red Sea. We get to stories about a Jonah uh, being swallowed by a big fish. And then, in the creed today, uh, we come to the idea of a virgin birth. And we say, that's impossible. And you're right, it is impossible. Because it's a miracle. miracle. Yes. Um, and then even on, further on in the creed, we're going to see that Jesus rose from the dead, which is a miracle. And then at the end of the creed, we're going to find out that we're, you and I are going to rise from the dead, which is a miracle. All right. So, so you... None of this will make sense unless you acknowledge the fact that miracles are possible, that there is a supernatural world. A hundred years ago, there was a, a big push in the church that were, quite frankly, haven't recovered from the damage it's done yet, of, you know, nobody believes in miracles anymore. We've got to figure out a way to preach a version of Christianity uh, that, that doesn't have things like creation and virgin births and resurrections, all that stuff that ancient people believe. Modern people can't accept that. Let's figure out a way to preach our faith without all that nonsense. And they tried, and they failed. It fell apart. And so if you want to know why, if you want to know why you, you drive on your way to a place like this, and in fact this place has happened, be, and not just because of COVID, but if you ever wonder why you drive past empty church after empty church after empty church, especially in mainline Protestantism, and think, what happened? This happened. We took away, we threw away our faith to... Um, please what Frederick Schleiermacher called the cultured despisers of religion. We tried to get the science people to like us and respect us, and we threw away our faith. And when we threw away our faith, guess what? There's no reason to come to church, so people stop coming. And if there's one thing my generation is trying to do, is we're trying, my generation of preachers, at least some of us, are trying to get us back into a supernatural worldview, in addition to a natural one. Anyway, that's my big project on, on miracles. Because if there's no miracles, there's no Bible. It's quite simple. No Bible, no miracles, no Bible, no Bible, no Christianity, you might as well all go home. Uh, the virgin birth is a central miracle uh, for uh, Christianity because it tells us who Jesus is. Jesus fulfills an Old Testament prophecy from Isaiah 7, 14 that says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and we will call him Emmanuel. Uh, by the way, this is free. I'm probably taking too much time. Uh, when, when, when the church tried to explain away the virgin birth, they, they said nonsense like, Oh, well, this word here in Hebrew, it doesn't necessarily mean virgin. It means uh, young woman. Okay, but here's the problem. Isaiah said it would be a sign. A young woman conceiving a child is not a sign, right? It happens quite frequently. It's not a sign. A virgin conceiving and giving birth, that's a sign. The, this is the incarnation, the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us, as John 1.14 says. Uh, this is not a case of, like many people want to say, well, there was this guy named Jesus, and he was a really good guy, and he was a really nice guy, and, and he was such a good guy that, that he became the Son of God. God liked him so much that he made him his son. Uh, 
but that's exactly the opposite. There wasn't some guy that became the Son of God. There was a Son of God that became the Son of God. The Son of God came down and took on flesh. Colossians 2 9 says, For in Christ the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. But the question is why? And I think Sonia preached that part of my sermon uh, today. She couldn't, I couldn't have done it better myself. In that, um, first of all, he had to come down. Because we couldn't have understood unless he come down. And he came to live our life. Hebrews 4.15 says, Well, we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with us, with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Philippians 2, 5, 3, I read, I, read, I and Sonia uh, read last week uh, from the end of Philippians uh, chapter 2, or at least from the middle of it. I'm going to go more toward the beginning, Philippians 2, 5, 3. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset that, that is Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in human form. As a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Which brings us to our next topic for today, Jesus' passion. Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate is the only other human being mentioned by name in the creed right after the Virgin Mary. Now, why is Pontius Pilate's name in there? I want to suggest to you for two reasons. Number one, historical reason. Number two, a political one. First of all, the fact that this mentions Pontius Pilate places these events at a particular time and place. Uh, you can go back in the history and verify most of the events of the Bible. Some we have to take on faith. We've been talking about that for the last couple of weeks. But this, this is history. Secular history tells us that there was a man named Pontius Pilate who was the Roman governor in Judea, in Jerusalem, between the years 26 and 36 AD. You can go back and check that. Secular history tells us that while Pontius Pilate was in power in that place, among the probably thousands of people that were crucified was a man named Jesus of Nazareth. That, that is a secular historical verifiable fact. Now, back a hundred years ago, there were people trying to say that, that Jesus was a myth, and there was a person called Jesus, but now even history has shown us better. So there's, it's not, it's not, you know, once upon a time. It's not long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away. You can, you know when it happened, you know where it happened, you can check the facts. So there's a historical reason. There's also a political reason. For example, if I were to tell you um, that you know I was in elementary school during the Reagan administration, right? Um, and I would tell you about something that happened during the Reagan administration. That's that's especially if I think it was something that wasn't right or you know something they screwed up. Um, that would be both a historical statement and a political one. It tells you when it happened, but it also tells you a little bit about our opinion about it. That's the same thing that's going on here in the creed. At the time the creed began to be used as a baptismal statement in the middle of the third century, that's the years that start with 200. We're now in the years that start with 2000. Those are the years that start with 200. Um, it, this, this creed was used, recited, memorized by those who were being baptized in the church. And as a part of being baptized in the church, they had to lay the crucifixion of Jesus at the feet of the empire. And make that political statement against the empire. This was at a time when Christianity was an illegal religion. It wasn't unpopular. It, it wasn't... It wasn't you know, ridiculed, it was illegal. 
come into your house, drag you away, feed you to lions, illegal. It didn't, it's not like us when your neighbors make fun of you. No, it was your neighbors turned you in and had you uh, killed. And so, to make this statement was a powerful statement against the power of the empire. So it was a historical statement and a political statement. Jesus was crucified. Right? We, we go to that every Good Friday. We know that. We know what that looks like. How horrible that was. A favorite uh, Roman method of execution, especially for troublemakers, so that they could point to that and say, here, this is what happens to people who defy Rome. Although, for the early Christians, every time they recited the creed, they were defying Rome. He died. Right? There was some nonsense going around about how Jesus didn't really die. He just kind of passed out, and then he felt better. Um, you know, what's, what's that one? I thought you died, I got better. What's that? Right. Squirrel. Um, Jesus died. He died. That's what crucifixion does, right? The Romans were good at what they did. He died, and he was placed in a tomb. And so we can often ask ourselves, right, as we're going through the creed, and we see this, this, this creed as kind of a condensation, a summarization of the Christian faith. But even, even past the creed, we might ask ourselves, well, what's the most important thing? What's the center of the center of the center of the gospel? Well, Paul tells us that in Corinthians 15, 3 through 4. He said, but what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance. So listen up, right? I, I, Paul, Paul's, I've been writing in 15 chapters of Corinthians, but now this is what's most important. Listen up. That Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scripture. And that's where we'll pick up next week. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for the creed. God, we, we know that the creed does not replace our Bible. It simply summarizes it for us. God, we thank you for its, its brevity, but also for its completeness. That it tells us the basics of what we need to know. God, we pray that you would help us to embrace it and the truths that it tells us. And God, that we would, we would make those truths our truth. Make that faith our faith. That we may know and have eternal life. God, we pray for this church. We pray that you bless us and help us to grow and prosper. Help us to worship and serve you in spirit and in truth and serve the world in your name. God, we pray for the whole body of Christ throughout the world. We pray for the persecuted church. We pray for the United Methodist Church. We pray for this annual conference and our bishop will in this district and our superintendent. We pray for our community, our nation, and our world in these troubled times. God, we pray for an end of this coronavirus pandemic and the restoration of our communities. God, we pray for social and political and racial and spiritual healing in our nation. We pray for men and women who serve us at home and abroad. We pray for our world leaders at every level. And we pray for ourselves, our families, our church, our community, our nation, and the whole world the blessings of peace, justice, health, safety, freedom, stability, prosperity, and holiness. And now, God, we pray that you hear the prayers of each and every heart that is worshiping with us today, whether in person or online, as we lift our prayers up to you, either silently or aloud, saying, in Jesus' name, amen.
Loving God, you have heard our prayers here this morning, and you hear the prayers that remain silent on our hearts. God, you know our every need, and we do not know how to pray. Your Spirit intercedes for us with groanings that are too deep for words. And God, we pray that you hear us now as we lift our voices together in the prayer which our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you please stand and join me in professing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. As we prepare for communion this morning, just a uh, few words of instruction. Uh, for those of you who are joining us online, I would invite you to join, as we're, we're receiving communion here, I would invite you to participate in the act of spiritual communion, which you'll find uh, in the bulletin. Uh, and in that, uh, you receive the spiritual benefits of communion when you cannot uh, be present to receive uh, communion physically. Having said that, if you are someone who is still at home and you would like uh, communion, please contact me. I'm happy to have you come here or me come to you and do that safely. I'm very uh, willing um, and wanting to do that. Uh, for those of you that are here present, uh, um, I'll be distributing communion to you in the pews. Um, they come in these little prepackaged cups. Uh, there is a top plastic seal uh, under which is the wafer, and then a foil seal, uh, un and under that is the, the juice. Um, go ahead and feel free to uh, consume once you receive. Um, there are little buckets uh, scattered throughout the pews uh, to place the empty cups in uh, when you're done. Dear friends, the United Methodist Church practices open communion. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who truly love him, all who earnestly repent of their sins, and all who seek to live in peace with one another. And young children are welcome to participate in the discretion of their parents. Therefore, let us prepare ourselves for this holy sacrament by confessing and repenting of our sins in silence. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Before the mountains were brought forth, for you had formed the earth. From everlasting to everlasting, you alone are God. You created light out of darkness and brought forth light on the earth. 
You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenants we are sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of the Father, heaven and earth are full of your glory, who is not in your minds. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, who is not in your minds. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ in whom you have revealed yourself, our light and our salvation. Your spirit anointing him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Break from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts of Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving <coughs> as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ is dead. Christ, Christ, Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast of this heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever.
you please join me in the prayer after communion? Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord.
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord, and may the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit go with you now and remain with you always. Let us go into the world to make disciples of Jesus Christ, experiencing grace, exploring truth, expressing love. Amen.